If you're looking for ways to expand your product sales to other countries without creating a complex and expensive distribution network, you'll want to listen to today's interview with the inventor of the couch coaster and hear how he grew from a local business in the UK to a high growth international powerhouse. Welcome to another episode of the Harvest Growth Podcast, focused on helping consumer product companies, inventors, and entrepreneurs harvest the growth potential of their product businesses. Today, I'm really excited to be speaking with Barry Frieder. He's the owner and founder of hitproducts.com. One of their most well-known products is called the Couch Coaster. We'll talk about that product. He's got a couple others on his site as well, some really innovative products that he's developed over the years. I'm excited to share with you a little bit more about the products, but also the story behind the scenes of how he became so successful over the years. I think we're going to get some great sound bites and bits of information that'll be helpful to anybody really at any stage of your business. Barry, thanks so much for joining us and being on the show today. Thanks for the invitation, John. Really nice to be with you. So first question for our audience, let's talk about all your products, but your first one, kind of your, your hero product today sure. is called the Couch Coaster. So tell That's us what right. is the Couch Coaster, Coaster and how does it work? Um, the Couch Coaster essentially is a cup holder that sits um, on the arm of a sofa and holds a drink. So it's a really simple product, but it's really relevant to lots and lots of people. Um, I basically came up with the idea um, when I was living in a flat at the time and we had a, we had a sofa with like a big curved arm and I was always balancing, um, you know, a bottle of Peroni or something like that on the sofa arm. Um, usually watching match of the day, one of our football shows, shows over here in the UK and inevitably, you know, sometimes it toppled over and made a mess. So I basically wanted to solve that problem and that's how the couch coaster came about. That's fantastic. And we're going to dive much deeper into that particular product. But before we do, you've got a couple of other products on your website as well. Can you talk about those? Yeah, sure. So um, the second product that um, I launched after Couch Coaster was Table Coaster. And that's sort of um, what I um, tend to call uh, Couch Coaster's little brother. It's sort of the desktop version of Couch Coaster. So it's another anti spill coaster, but it just... Um, uh, adheres to any smooth flat surface um, and obviously has a sort of wall design that prevents the drink from toppling over if it's sort of accidentally knocked or bumped. And um, over the years, you know, that that product has also done extremely well in, in markets that I never even envisaged selling in, in fact, um, Japan being one of them, for example, where um, a lot of sort of the social leisure time that families spend sort of on the floor, whether it's sleeping or getting together, having a meal. So Table Coaster sort of really found a, a strong home around the world as well. And the third product that I launched more recently, um, just before the pandemic end of sort of 2019, <coughs> excuse me, was a mobile phone accessory called Phone Tag. Now, I always loved the idea of sort of being able to prop my phone up, but all of the ring holders on the market, if you're familiar with those, were perfectly round and they only ever provided for a landscape um, phone stand. So phone tag takes on the idea of the ring holder, but by virtue of its shape, which is sort of tag shape, so it's got an elongated end, it actually allows you to position, position the phone in a horizontal or a vertical position. So it sort of does both directions and it's much more functional on that level. That's great. And I'll encourage the audience. And if you're driving and listening, uh, I'll, we'll put this in the show notes as well, but check out Barry's website, which is hitproducts.com. You can find all his products on Amazon and many other places as well, uh, but check out the website just to, to learn more about him for sure. Once you, once you get the chance. So Barry, you shared with me some of your really interesting story, I think, of how you began this journey of launching your own products. At the, at the time, you had a full-time job and left that to pursue this. Couch Coaster was your first big success. Can you That's rewind right. the clock a little bit and tell us, how did you begin your journey? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it really goes back to my childhood in a strange way, John. I was always like making things um, as a child um, from, you know, normally bits of rubbish, frankly, that my parents were, were going to throw away, whether it was an old cereal box or, or some tubes of sorts. And I was kind of building, assembling things in my room. Um, I think the most infamous um, 
in, invention that I built when I was um, much younger what was the rifle that fired barbecue sticks of all things. I managed to shoot myself in the hand and, and landed myself in hospital with that one. Um, and I thought that was the end of my inventing career. Um, but, you know, uh, as the years went by, I, I sort of, um, I, I knew that I wanted to do something in design. I studied architecture at university in the UK um but but strangely i sort of fell out of love with that and i ended up working in the property industry in, in real estate for 10 years um and it was only in 2015 when i was made redundant um from my last uh, property role um that i decided you know then was the, the right time for me to uh, set up my own business and um and go forth with um sort of the strongest idea i'd had today because i was always you know messing around with prototypes in my spare time and sure enough that was this cup holder for a sofa um my my friends and, and family thought I was you know completely bonkers um, leaving a you know the safety of a monthly paycheck from you know a well recognized industry like like real estate to um to think I could make a living from selling a cup holder of all, of all things but um after a year's worth of sort of developing the product and then launching it at um, some consumer and business shows in the UK you know, it, it got a fantastic reception. And that really was the, the, the bedrock and the foundation of the business. And so uh, let's talk about those trade shows, because I believe that was one of your, in, in your you mentioned before, early successes. How, talk about that first show. How did you get orders at a retail trade show without experience, without a track record or, or being able to show success? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I knew that I wanted to to launch this product in a sort of very lean fashion. I think I I think um, in the year of developing, I've been reading um, uh, the Lean Startup by Eric Ries, and it was all about sort of spending as little money as possible, iterating, learning, failing, you know, rinse, repeat, watch that type of thing, um, and I kind of knew that launching at a trade show with a small stand, not spend a huge budget was a fantastic way to basically get a product in front of the right group of people, be that consumers to be able to sort of test direct selling to the end user or a business show where, of course, you've got, you know, buyers and wholesalers, distributors walking the shows. So that's exactly what I did within um, a couple of months of landing product into my second bedroom, which was my warehouse at the time. Um, you know, I was showing my product to, to, to hundreds, if not thousands of people at these shows. And, you know, there is no better place to get a first hand reaction to your product. Yeah. And, and finding, you know, not every retailer is open to taking on true innovation, but luckily there are still are great re retailers out there that can fall in love with the product and really help you take off and get off the ground. You know, from there, you moved on to many other marketing channels, one of which was QVC. So, can you share with us your experience? How was it working with QVC? Yeah, so I mean, it was it was a chance meeting with um, an agent, in fact, that that, that represents QVC um, at a trade show in Birmingham, UK, um, and um, they 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 loved the product. They wanted to back it, and they introduced it to QVC um in in a few different countries you know where they've got relationships and um you know we, we scored some features on on the uk channel um i flew to paris to do a to do a french edition um which was interesting because i had a translator in my ear and had to kind of keep up appearances that i knew what i was talking about um and you know it was shown in germany as well um and stateside, um, I actually flew over to um, St. Petersburg in Florida, um, where the product was shown on HSN, um, obviously now part of the, the QVC family. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, those were great platforms to, to show the product. Um, interestingly, and, and, you know, honestly, it didn't do unbelievably well um, as a shopping channel product so it didn't get any re-airings but you know i truly believe that you know if there's a marketing opportunity available to any startup you know you grab that with both hands you give it your best shot um and you know 100 you know that has created an unknown number of sales for me in other sales channels it's placed my products in more homes around the world than i could have imagined um and you know, shopping channels are a tough business. I think um, a lot of your listeners will know that. Um, and, um, you know, some, some products um, that the buyers think will be absolute, you know, um, winners, they're not. 
and some that they think will be winners. Um, sorry, sorry, some that won't, won't be, will be. So it really swings in roundabouts and they never quite know until that product runs on, you know, those shopping channels as to which way they're going to come out and wash. Yeah. And, and I've seen, like you said, both sides and it's really hard to predict for any product which marketing channels are going to be best for them, right? So QVC sure. could be difficult for your business and a home run for another, but other marketing channels might flip-flop, right? And that's the importance I think you kind of alluded to in the beginning, especially of a business, if as you're working to grow it, testing different concepts, different marketing channels or different marketing creative copy, et cetera, can be so important to nail down what's really going to work for the business and, and not giving up, right? So you got a great product. It's working in more, some marketing channels. You know, QVC may or may not move on to the next one, right? So find other ways to go to the business. And one of the things you did next, I think, in your inner sequence or about the same time potentially was starting to work with some online or website catalogs. Uh, gromit.com. It was one example back in the day that I think you mentioned to yeah. me before we spoke here, it really helped to get off the ground from a, from a internet perspective and, and an overseas perspective. How did that help your propel the growth of the business when getting into these online catalogs? Yeah. Um, I was very fortunate to, um, to be introduced to Gromit. It was actually sort of through um you know a peer in my network who i was kind of tapping into a little bit as a mentor at the time which um you know um i i strongly recommend anyone do who's sort of thinking of entering you know a, a new market for sure um and, and you know needs to learn the ropes and um, he had previously sold one of his products on the gromit um, he introduced me to their discovery director at the time and you know the gromit uh, such a fantastic company um they really back small businesses and their products um and i was blown away when they put in a first purchase order for just over ten thousand units um which it's kind of nearly unheard of you know um, even if you were you know introducing a first product to a you know maybe a walmart target these days you know that's a punchy first purchase order so they um they made that order i delivered on it and you know they put my products in front of so many eyeballs it was such an amazing opportunity you know they they got tv segments for it um the product um was then written about by many many different online publications you know be it you know a buzzfeed or a good housekeeping um that earned so much sort of free publicity for the product often pointing back um through you know affiliate marketing links as people use these days over to the Gromit or my Amazon page. So it just kind of like escalated from there in the States. Yeah. And and you and I just talked about some sad news that came out very recently about the Gromit where they are ceasing operations soon is you know business yeah. changes unfortunately. So I wanted to bring that story up. I think there was a positive side to the Gromit because it can be taken to other businesses that'll be around for a long time. But one of the benefits of working with an online catalog like that is that it gives you, as you mentioned, free PR, right? They've got an audience. They share yeah. your product with their audience and other platforms. We'll talk about Amazon in, in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the issues with Amazon as you start off with a brand new product is, hey, how do you get, they've got a massive audience, but how do you get break through the clutter and get shown to their audience with a yeah. new product, et cetera. And that's one of the things where Gromit was fantastic. And then there are other marketing channels that are similar, other ways to make sure that you get traffic. So even if you're selling on Amazon, how do you get awareness? How do you get traffic to your site, to Amazon, et cetera? So today that might be through a paid media strategy, let's say on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. Um, exactly. may, have to, may have to replace a Gromit. So I, you know, I think it worked well, obviously for your business it was a, not just that order, but I, I know many other orders passed that one as well and drove yes. a lot of success. And then the next step of your business, as I understand it, is, is starting to have a lot of success on Amazon, right? Exactly. Um, I mean, it was impossible to ignore, um, you know, obviously Amazon, you know, had been operational in the UK for, for some time, just like in the States, you know, it's a very strong market over here in the UK, obviously <laughs> the, the economy is, you know, <laughs> not doing great now. And I'm sure you're reading about that um, in the news, you know, and, and, and vice versa. But, um, you know, we have, I think, over 500 million consumers in Europe. So collectively we are a, a huge consumer base, bigger than the United States. Um, and, and Amazon has, you know, been, building more and more fulfillment centers across Europe, just like it has over in America. 
Um, but, you know, I started Slowly on Amazon, launched on the UK platform, um, soon sort of joined their pan-European program where you could ship to UK and then they distributed product across the border to Europe. Um, that is more tricky now with our break away from the EU, but it's still very viable. There's still lots of business being done. Um, and then, you know, sure enough, as soon as I started selling in America, which wasn't on my to-do list, it wasn't in my business plan, really. Um, it was quite clear that, you know, I would be silly to, to not ship from the manufacturing base over in the Far East to, um, to the USA as well. So I quickly opened the USA um, I think that was followed by Japan, which was followed by Australia, which was followed by Canada. So I think the real lesson for, for your audience, um, for anyone who's sort of not followed this, this method, if, 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 if you know, they're interested in how I've scaled, is, um, is to think about um, how you can move your product to lots of different countries, tap into that Amazon fulfillment network, um, it's it's basically shrunk the supply chain. Whereas in the past, you may have manufactured in China, sold to a distributor that would have sold to a wholesaler, that would have sold to a retailer, that then would have sent to the consumer. Now you have factory, you have um, brand, you have Amazon, and you have the end consumer. So it's just contracted everything. Um, that's not to say we're all making more money because boy, do Amazon know how to charge. And, and that's obviously well documented across the web and in lots of Amazon seller groups as well. Um, it's tough. It's not easy, but the opportunity they provide to distribute product and get your product in the hands of consumers in markets you never imagined even selling in is, is next to nothing. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up that international benefit. Obviously, you're based in the UK, selling in the States and across the world. I get that question all the time from a lot of our clients, you know, hey, we're doing really well in the US. How do we expand abroad? And as you mentioned, five years ago, it used to be a different answer. Like you had to find a distributor, right? You know, yeah. unless you're going to set up boots on the ground and an extensive distribution network, it was very difficult. But going through a distributor that had connections to retailers, et cetera, it was a whole process, right? You had to rely on them. But now yeah. you can become that distributor or really work with Amazon to, to become that, to have touch points directly with consumers in Africa, Asia, Australia, across the world yeah. in a much simpler exactly. way. Exactly. I mean, the links I acquired through the business shows I attended, and I went to many in the UK. I went to a big show in Germany called Ambiente in Frankfurt, which is a very big consumer goods show. Um, I went to Atlanta um, for their big giftware show. You know, I, I went to the big ones that were really relevant to, to my products at the time. Um, and, you know, I met retailers and I met distributors. And for the first, you know, three-ish years of the business, that is how I was doing most of the selling. But, you know, within the seven years I've been selling now, the retail landscape has just completely changed. You know, we've seen retailers fail um, and we've seen some retailers win, but they've transformed their business plans. A lot of the retailers that are still in business now, they seem to be doing more sourcing developing their own brands um, and buying, you know, products from the Far East that way. Uh, Bed Bath Beyond, for example, you know, um, would be a good sort of case study there. Um, but the brands that, that are, sorry, the, the retailers that are still buying from the brands that um, are still also selling on Amazon, they're the ones that are suffering because there's no product differentiation. So, you know, the, the retail landscape has been shaken up. Amazon's grown and grown exponentially. And, you know, brands have had to just work out what, what is right for them. For me, it's, it's been sort of jumping on the Amazon bandwagon and, and, and milking that as far and wide as possible. Yeah, great point. Barry, do you have any resources that you recommend to our audience? Any books, podcasts, shows, events that have been really helpful and transformative for your business? Um, I'd say in the early days, it was sort of definitely tapping into the minds of those that have been there before me, not being afraid to ask questions of, of those more learned, those more advanced, um, you know, don't, 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 don't be shy of, of picking someone's brain. People often like to talk about their experiences and share, you know, their success because they want other people to be successful. You know, I filled in lots of phone calls from, 
you know, um, some product design firms I've worked in the past where they've got clients and they're sort of thinking about a product idea, but they're a bit nervous, you know. Um, you know, that was me back in the day, sort of um, wanting to get that advice and information from, from those that have trodden that path before. So definitely, um, you know, uh, trying to establish some links there. Um, I would also say, in terms of sort of new product development, it can be risky, it can be expensive, um, and everyone sort of has their own strategies to what to do there. Um, I used to just prototype everything in cardboard, old pizza boxes. Yeah. Um, the prototype of Couch Coaster was a Domino's pizza box that I'd carved into this curved shape with a recess to pop my beer in, and that was it. And, you know, as soon as you show somebody it, Aesthetically, it doesn't look the part. It just looks like a bit of cardboard with a hole in it. But functionally, yeah, you can see where I'm going with that. And that's the sort of seed of the idea. Um, so I always encourage people to sort of, you know, m make a rough idea of it, you know, preferably in 3D so you can get a real tangible feel as yeah. to, you know, how this product might look and feel and, and operate. Yeah. And, and with 3D printing technology coming down to, if it's not a flexible product like yours, you know, hardest, those are great things to do. I would know years ago, that was thousands of dollars. Now you can get it done for tens or hundreds of dollars, depending how small the product might be. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Keep it, keep the investment low in the beginning as you're figuring it out. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Barry, is there anything I didn't ask you that you think could be helpful for our audience? Um, I think one of the things that um, I'm sort of more and more cautious of is, is how expensive advertising has become online. I think as, you know, even as new channels, you know, like TikTok and other things have developed, um, I think it's really hard for brands um, today, like a lot harder than it was, you know, in my position seven years ago. There's so much noise on the internet. We're, we're thrown so much information when we scroll our social feeds. Um, you know, paid advertising can be expensive. Um, I think today, when you design a product, you have to think just as much about how you're going to market your product um, as the product itself. You know, creating a good product it is actually like less than half the battle won. How are you going to get that product? You know seen and then sold is the other bigger chunk of the puzzle and unless you have a strategy um you know your your, your product just might get lost in in the you know in, in the in the sort of in the space time you know conundrum yeah no great point i was just talking with uh one of the pioneers the infomercial industry here in the u.s from you know back in the 80s about how easy it was back then, where it was a new marketing medium. Anything you put on TV back then, almost anything would sell and sell a lot. It was, you know, it was a wild west. It was really easy. Sure. And really the internet used to be like that, right? So to call it 10, 15 years ago, as each marketing channel, first Google, then Facebook, Instagram, then so many other marketing channels since then. If you're at the front of that, you know, incline or that, that rapidly changing uh, time, then you can really take advantage of it. And right now we're, it's, it's different, right? You've got to have strategy. It's not, you not, a, any great product is not going to sell well without great marketing. You're exactly right. You've got to have the story behind it and do it in an effective way. And, you know, I, I will say we still see great successes. We have a client right now with, with kind of those wild west numbers where every dollar they spend, they're generating 20 to $25 in revenue. It's insane, right? It's, wow. it's, it's a lot of fun. But it takes a lot of strategy to get there, right? It's not easy. You got to figure that yeah. out. And, and it's, you know, not every business is going to be quite that successful, but it, it still can be done. But you're right. Yeah. You got to do it the right way up front. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Oh, I do want to encourage our listeners, pl please go to check out Barry's products at hitproducts.com, or you can search for Couch, Couch Coaster or his other products directly on Amazon. If you search for him, you'll find him quickly. He's got a great presence on there. And be sure to check out harvestgrowthpodcast.com to see other episodes we've recorded. And if you like this episode, you want to learn more about how you can profitably grow your consumer product business, please subscribe to our show and leave us a review at iTunes or Google Play. Barry, thanks again. I really appreciate the time today. Thanks for having me, John.